Hello and thank you for joining us for this PROAC's first webinar with Automotive Logistics. My name is Louis Yakumi and I'm the publisher of Automotive Logistics magazine. As you know, this webinar will showcase PROAC's latest unique software solution capabilities for the planning, management and execution of complex end-to-end plant-to-dealer finished vehicle supply chains. PROACT will discuss how its software will enable manufacturers to regain more control of their supply chain whilst continuing to outsource the component parts, how logistics providers and 4PLs to improve technology solutions in their supply chain planning, and for traditional 3PLs to elevate both their value proposition and importance to their clients. With us we have PROACT Paul Nurse. Paul has been a director with PROACT for over 20 years and has in-depth knowledge of the global, global supply chain market, having worked extensively in the US, Europe and Asia, much of it within the finished vehicle logistics market. Before we start, I'd like to remind all of you in attendance to draft up some questions which Paul will be pleased to answer in the Q&A session following his presentation. Please ask these questions by typing them into the box in the lower right hand side of your screen. If you should happen to experience any technical issues during this session, please also type these into the Q&A box and our team will do their best to sort these out for you. So sit back and relax and we hope you'll find this webinar stimulating and informative. And I'll now, now hand it over to Paul so that he can begin his presentation. Thank you. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Louis. Uh, hello and welcome to, uh, to the Proact International webinar today. I'm Paul Nurse, as, uh, as Louis just said, CEO of Proact, uh, and I'm going to be taking you through uh, the presentation that we have today. Uh, we do have a limited amount of time, about 30 minutes for the presentation, so um, clearly I'll be taking you through the subject matter at, at a fairly high level today. Um, but needless to say, if there's anybody who wants to, uh, to follow up on this and look at things in more detail, um, then uh, you're more than welcome then to uh, uh, contact us either via Louis and his team or, uh, or directly with, uh, with us here at, uh, at PROACT. Before we get into the presentation, um, what I'd like to do is just to uh, briefly uh, set the agenda. What we would like to do today is, is really firstly um, to try and give you our perspective of the issues and challenges in the industry that we come across um, when we're having our discussions on a, on a day to day basis. Um, also, we want to try and give you a, an overview of where we see Proact's role in that market, uh, and also uh, an overview of the scope of our solutions and, and, and the capability. Um, finally, we'd like to just try and visualize some of those things and show you how uh, Proact can either help address, um, either alleviate, or, or at least support many of those challenges and issues that, uh, uh, that we see on a daily basis. Uh, as Louis said as well, at the end there we'll have uh, we'll have a Q and A session and be happy to take uh, any questions that uh, that are raised. So let's begin. What you'll see here is a slide which basically summarises just a few of the many different issues and challenges we hear uh, from from various stakeholders that we that we speak to on a day to day basis. It's in no particular order, uh, but these are some of the main ones. Um, one of those, the top one there, uh, is the age-old issue of forecasting versus uh, capacity. Uh, I've sat in on a number of, uh, of Louis' very fine conferences and, uh, and listened to manufacturers uh, proposing to carriers and service providers that they invest more in, in new assets and increased network capacity. I've also heard the carriers and the service providers uh, respond to that along the lines of, well, how can I invest possibly tens of millions of dollars in new assets when I don't know what the day-to-day -day utilization is going to be from year to year, month to month? Uh, it may be the case that in two years' time, I may have to mothball many of those assets. Um, so having forecasts and project projections is, is, is one thing, but understanding exactly what that means on the extended supply chain, on the different modes that are dependent on each other ultimately, and where we have many different service providers, again, either dependent or independent on each other's actions, uh, and where the consequence of failure or success 
uh, of one of those service providers is felt by all the others upstream and downstream. When you take into all those all those factors into into account, it's clearly not straightforward in terms of uh, being able to to exactly determine what the volume, what the throughput, and what the availability of assets needs to be. The other thing we hear is is that of complexity um, and the ability to deal with increased level of complexity within the supply chain. Um, new markets, new channels, shifting production, uh, new handling methods, new technologies, electric, for example. Um, increased value-added activities both at source and within the supply chain, um, and the personalization of models. Um, increasingly, uh, consumers are being given more and more opportunity to, to configure unique and bespoke vehicle attributes with the intention of making the vehicles more personal to them. All of those things increase the complexity of the supply chain. And for the 3PL, the third-party logistics provider, the lead logistics provider, the ability to deal with different processes, uh, which are manufacturer-based, which are model-based, which are market-based, uh, which are specific to dealers, specific to the individual VIN or vehicle itself, uh, and many other parameters that will determine exactly what the process is that that particular vehicle is going to go, go through. And there are many, many variations. So the ability to deal with that level of complexity is, is a key issue in the market. Collaboration, coordination. Again, as we get more complex supply chains, we typically get more service providers, more partners, uh, more carriers, and therefore the ability to coordinate all of their actions um, and give them the ability to collaborate through uh, hopefully one central point is key. Um, again, we're not talking about just a, uh, many different service providers that work in isolation. As I said, the consequence of success or failure by one service provider is often felt upstream or downstream by the other. So again, managing that in a, in a joined up and integrated fashion is another key uh, requirement. Again, today, yards and the supply chain are often managed as two separate operations, um, whereby in reality what goes in in the yard is integral to the entire end-to-end -end supply chain. The effect of what goes, in the, it goes on in the yard is often lost when the vehicle enters the yard and doesn't become apparent until the vehicle exits the yard at, at, at the end. Um, so again, what we need then is the ability to, to have those yard activities integrated into the overall supply chain and the effect of those activities, again, uh, being pushed through into, into the entire supply chain. Another old issue is that of push and pull between manufacturers and dealers. Manufacturers wanting to push uh, inventory into the network uh, and dealers wanting to take more control of how quickly they take that inventory, when they get that inventory. A lot of the problems there are to do with predictability, reliability, um, confidence in the delivery dates, the promise dates. And again, those things are, are really the key to, to, to alleviating that issue. Cost within the supply chain, the ability to predict what the cost of moving a VIN from the US to Asia, for example, is going to cost you. The ability to accurately accrue all the costs across all the different service providers. Uh, and the ability to ensure that you're actually either charging or being charged the right amount at the end of all that. Again, these are issues uh, that are difficult to manage today, and, and especially when we have many different participants in the supply chain. The other key term we hear banded around quite a bit in the market is control tower. Um, and control tower really means governance and control across the entire supply chain, but one central point of governance and control over everything. So again, that follows on into the ability to, to have better KPI measures, to better interpret where the problems are, uh, and to deal with all the noise around those problems. And then ultimately, visibility, uh, the one that we always come back to. Whether that's plant to dealer or whether it's some part of the supply chain, it's the ability to have one version of the truth uh, for everybody in that supply chain. So whether it's the, 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 the client, the service providers, uh, the, the dealer, maybe even the consumer, all of those people having one common view of what's going on in the supply chain. And, and really what all this culminates in is a, is a reliable and accurate promise state. That's sort of the, the, the ultimate holy grail here. We want to know that we're going to deliver that vehicle uh, in the best possible way, in the most efficient way, uh, without damage uh, and delivered on, on the, uh, the, 
the promised date. Now, these are the issues that, uh, that we see as generic within the industry, but clearly our discussions go beyond that into the stakeholder issues. And those are with people like the third-party logistics companies, um, lead logistics providers, manufacturers, and, and they all have different views of, of, of the industry and, and their needs. So um, from a, a 3PL point of view, I mean, and the 3PL is our, our oldest customer base, um, they are typically traditional or have been traditional asset-based third-party logistics companies. They offer in, operating in a market with uh, very low margins or increasingly lower margins and, and increasingly commoditized uh, in the services, typically moving products from port to port, from, from yard to yard, from railhead to railhead, depending on their specific focus in mode, or they might be running yards or, or whatever, but they're typically uh, operating in some sense within, within the supply chain. And what many of those clients or, or customers that we deal with are looking for are ways to not only increase the revenue uh, that they see and, and, and get, a, get over the low margins, but basically to add enough value to improve those margins so that what the, the, the revenue they are uh, creating is, is high margin revenue, it's value revenue. Um, so their need is that of raising their value proposition, the scope of their service, and ultimately increase the importance of their service to, to their clients. And in doing that, secure the contracts, protect the business they have, and, and ultimately protect the utilization of the assets, which again uh, is a core part of, of, of many of their, their, their businesses. Lead logistics providers, and, and again, in, in, in probably in the last 10 years, a lot of our business has been in the LLP uh, market. They have a slightly different view. They've either been set up specifically as an LLP entity, or they're possibly a, a 3PL uh, setting up LLP operations of some kind. They have the value proposition, they've, they, they've made the higher value proposition, but most, if not all, have, have very little in the way of supporting technology to, to, to do that. They've committed to managing, coordinating uh, the extended supply chains, whether, again, that's from plant to dealer or, or otherwise, and they have to manage all the component service providers, all the component costs, uh, the routings. Um, and all the other factors that go into that supply chain, added value, yards, whatever. Um, so their issue really is having a technology that can deal with that level of complexity. So finding a solution specifically geared to the LLP market that can provide them uh, or support them in offering an integrated end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain service for, for finished vehicles. More recently, um, we've increasingly been talking to manufacturers, and, and, and their view, again, is slightly different. Uh, again, they're increasingly looking to take more control over the management decision of their supply chain. Um, and that's really driven by the need for more flexibility, for more agility, um, and, and to be able to adapt to what's going on in the future in terms of production. Things like, uh, as I mentioned, more customization of vehicles, more bespoke vehicles, more customer-specific vehicles. So all the changes that, uh, that they see uh, are likely to happen going forward um, clearly need a level of flexibility and a, a level of agility to, to do that. And many wish to take that kind of control in-house, but without losing the benefits of outsourcing the, the component parts of the supply chain. Um, a few of them have sort of expressed that in the terms of, of of either needing to re retain or, or regain um, control of, of the intellectual property of the supply chain. So uh, in many cases, the, the supply chain is as much an integral part of the success of the product uh, as the product itself. So what a PROACT, what a PROACT finished vehicle capability? Well, firstly, a bit of background. Um, we see automotive supply chain as a, as a particular strength of, of of Proact and, and its solutions. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Proact CSM, which is uh, the enterprise supply chain manager. Uh, and finished vehicle logistics is a, is, a, is a key component of that. Over the years, we've, we've had quite a bit of experience in inbound uh, and, and aftermarket parts. But certainly, um, our strong focus today and, and, and for the coming years is, is really on finished vehicle logistics and, and, and also, obviously, yard management as a part of that. We believe our strength is in, is in the planning and the execution of, of the more complex supply chains. Um, 
the more changeable supply chains, adapting to change very quickly, um, dealing with various uh, levels of, of granularity within the supply chain and, and, and many different varying processes within the same supply chain. And we're trying to encompass all elements of that supply chain within the single system. So that's the, the, the physical transportation, the added value, the modification, uh, and all the other components that, that we expect to manage in the context of an of a, of end-to-end -end supply chain. And again, I say end-to-end, -end, that could be uh, plant-to-dealer, it could be plant-to-port, it could be port-to-dealer, or any part of that supply chain. The other thing we consider in, in, in finished vehicles is also high and heavy, and that, and that again has some specific requirements um, that again we can support within the, in the technologies that we offer. So over the last 20 years we've worked primarily with service providers and, and, and deployed solutions with them, uh, allowing them to, to, to manage uh, whether it be regional, global supply chains or, or yards um, for, for many well-known um, uh, manufacturers, uh, to global manufacturers. We believe we've amassed a great deal of knowledge and experience in, in, in doing that. Um, and our goal, really, with the product uh, that we have is, 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 is ultimately uh, that that product can emerge as a, as a, a global best-of-breed solution. The product itself um, we call the Enterprise Supply Chain Manager. Um, one of the fundamental pieces of that is the Enterprise Supply Chain Database. Uh, and essentially, it is a database that represents all entities in the supply chain once and only once, as opposed to possibly a traditional modular approach where um, we have many different databases for different components of the supply chain. We often end up with duplication issues of data, synchronization issues, uh, redundancy of data. Here, we have one enterprise database. Everything appears once, no matter how much uh, of the supply chain uh, you, you're, you're managing. And incidentally, this is also a wholly browser-based solution. So in terms of when we talk about visibility, collaboration, everybody can access it through a web browser. There is no technology that needs to be deployed whatsoever. Within the ESM, then, there are various layers. Um, the Enterprise Control Tower is made up of, of various other layers, which I'll talk about in a moment. But within that are the functional areas. So we can see things like uh, purchase order management, container, total supply chain, yard management, various other things in there. And you'll see most of those boxes um, are functional in nature, whereas the, 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 the top uh, right box there, finished vehicle logistics, is, is market specific. And that simply reflects the importance and the focus of the finished vehicle logistics market to, uh, uh, to product today. As we move through the different layers, one of the key layers, uh, one of the unique layers and probably one of the most differentiating layers for us is the supply chain execution engine. Um, that basically gives us, uh, or gives the end user the ability to configure supply chains of essentially unlimited complexity, scope, unlimited granularity, and provide the rules based on many different attributes uh, that determine how a particular VIN or whatever it might be behaves within that supply chain. So this is where most of the flexibility lies. With that then, a layers which support rating, billing, invoicing, tariffs, uh, the multimodal, intermodal support, um, support for language, the internationalization, language, currency, time zone, unit and measure, and clearly for 3PLs, LLPs, um, the, 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 the multi-client capability and multi-site capability is also key within that. On the top there, communication, connectivity, uh, collaboration, we'll, we'll come back to, uh, extensive forms of integration, um, of integration with systems, with integration with devices, and then MIS again, which is another element we'll come back to. So there are many layers of support that allow this to, to, to be deployed as a, as a global solution for either the whole supply chain or, or just one part of that supply chain. In terms of the scope that that represents, it looks something like this. Uh, Again, really just re-emphasizing the, the ability to cover factory to, to dealer activities and also uh, the yard management capabilities within that. That could be running the two things as one totally integrated solution, or indeed it could be, as many of our clients would do, run it as purely a, a lead logistics tool uh, and just running the, the management of the supply chain, or possibly just as a yard management tool, or indeed 
any combination of the two. So there is no mandatory minimum or maximum of functionality that you would use within, within this solution. You can use exactly how much in terms of functionality or in terms of, of the scope of the supply chain you need. That equates to quite a range of different uh, individual pieces of functionality there. I'm not going to dwell on this particular slide today, but again, it covers various elements of the supply chain. Again, to support that kind of level of, of supply chain management and integration, we have to deal with all the different types of integration. We have to deal with all the different uh, uh, stakeholders that we're integrating to and all the different methods of integration and also the ability to, uh, to integrate to many different uh, uh, devices that we use in the context of running that supply chain. So to the system itself. One of the main things we've discussed here is, is collaboration. Um, and in order to collaborate effectively, in order to bring as many different parties into the mix as possible, so again, whether that's client service providers, customs agents, dealers, consumers, or anybody else that has any kind of view or stake in the supply chain, we need to have different levels of control. We need to have profiles that allow us to specify what functionality, what menu systems, what um, MIS, what uh, mobile controls that that, that user is, is, is allowed to access and can access. Um, we might want to control the way that they interact with the process, what they can do within the process, the very specific elements of you know, whether they can uh, interact with processes or sub-processes or tasks as we call it. Um, and most importantly, the ability to control what data that individual sees. So in the profile, one of the key things is the, is the data restriction. Uh, and basically, as you see in a screen like this, we have many different parameters. We have contracts, yards, providers, and, and a whole host of different things on there, processes, tasks, document types, uh, and many more. But we can determine whether a particular user of this profile is allowed to access one, a subset, or all of the data within each of those categories. So if we wanted to limit a service provider, we would create the profile for a particular service provider. Whatever function they then come into within the system, they will be limited to the data for that particular service provider. Again, if we limited somebody to a yard, the same principle applies. So critically, we have the, 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 the mechanisms here to control exactly what individual users can see when they actually come into the system. We have the ability, in addition to that, then to define the functionality that they can access, the menu structures, um, and ultimately present them with some kind of menu, either a traditional hierarchical menu um, or something we call um, to-do lists, which we'll, we'll touch on uh, a little bit later on. Now, getting straight into the, the core of the supply chain piece, the way we start any particular project um, with any client is really to to sit down and, 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 and whiteboard the process. We're not limited by, if you like, out of the box processes that we must use. Uh, we can basically start with a blank piece of paper and say, what is it we need to do? Um, how do those processes change by vehicle? Um, how do they change by model or, or, or any of the different parameters we talked about? And essentially what we do is we take that model and we configure. Configure means end user. Uh, configuration in the system, not a technical configuration. We configure processes. We configure the behavior of those processes. We configure attributes, which are variable things. We can have as many of these attributes as we want, and we can configure decision logic based on those attributes. We can configure tasks, task types, how those tasks and processes behave in the overall supply chain, how they are constructed, how they're brought together to actually construct, to, to actually um, dynamically build a particular supply chain at the VIN level. And ultimately what we end up with, and this is very high level today, is the system being able to dynamically construct, create, project, whatever you want to term it, a supply chain at, for example, the VIN level as we see here. And, and in doing so, this, the system is deciding what's going to happen, where it's going to happen, when it's going to happen. It's looking at tariffs. Uh, and, and, and capacity to determine who can do that activity and who should be assigned to that activity in terms of the service provider. 
that is a dynamic plan, which means what you see on the screen now may change. It may change in the next hour. It may change tomorrow. It may change over the whole life of the VIN. And we're tracking all those changes. But most importantly, this is a dynamic projection system or a dynamic planning system. It is firstly projecting, predicting where the events should be happening, when they should be happening, and then from that point on, dynamically managing those. So the process you see on the screen is the result of a user configuration. What we're also doing is calculating costs. So in advance of that vehicle moving, we're determining who we're going to select based on fastest, cheapest, whatever the, the constraints are, which tariff is the most appropriate, and therefore what the cost is going to be. So we can add up all the component costs, whether they're in the same currency or, or many different currencies. We can total those component costs, um, and we can determine whether uh, there is a, a standard value that we're, that we're managing a variance against, or indeed, uh, if we're selling that service, we can determine the margin of that service that we're selling. So straight away, we have a view of, of what a supply chain is going to be, what will happen through its life, and what the cost of it is going to be. And again, I could show you many different examples of different processes. The process I just showed you there was based on, on something that is going in and out of a yard. So the little P icons there indicate that at this point it's going through yard activities, it's left the yard, um, and then it's going back into yard activities. But if it was just a, an end-to-end -end supply chain and we weren't using our yard management, indeed we could be integrating to somebody else's yard management system or systems through the life of this supply chain. But again, the system is planning and managing these things dynamically. And I can give you, again, many different examples of user-configured supply chains, um, whether they're different supply chains on common assets uh, or different supply chains within uh, common yards, whatever it might be. And with that, we're managing all the different operational uh, characteristics and attributes of that, of that vehicle, that supply chain, um, all the different tasks and subtasks that go on in that supply chain, um, all the different, uh, or, or viewing, and the ability to view all the different historical activities, so the auditability of that particular supply chain. Things like damage, things like hold code management, again, are all integral parts of this supply chain. Uh, the ability to attach documents, photographs of damage, again, they're all within the one system, the one integrated capability right through to the charging, to the matching, to the billing, to the invoicing um, of, of, of individual VINs within that supply chain. We also have the ability to accept production forecasts. This is where we start to address uh, or start to support uh, the issues of that capacity um, problem that I talked about right at the start, where we can, we can take a, 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 a production uh, forecast and basically interpret what that actually means on the different points in the supply chain and try and determine a requirement, an actual requirement based on dates, based on location as to what level of capacity we need at certain points at certain times in that supply chain. And again, we can manage the capacities, we can assign capacities, we can determine or set up the, the limitations on different service providers and their limitations in terms of capacities on different routes and different lanes. We can visualize that, we can see when lanes go from gray, which might be empty, to, to red, which might be fully occupied within a particular week. And again, we can track visually. Um, again, if we're receiving some kind of GPS feed, we can, uh, we can track those things visually within the system. We talked about menus a little earlier. We have another concept which we call to-do lists. Um, and to-do lists basically allow us to um, present the user with a list of things they need to do, rather than giving them menu options. With this list, basically they just click into the particular item. Um, and this is particularly good from, for, for any third party, where they can click into the item, it will show them how many vehicles that are pending, how many have been accepted, how many they've started working on, it will show them red, green, uh, alerts, and alerting is a, is a thing that, that, that's common throughout the system. Um, and basically, by clicking on one of these, take them straight to the activity that they need to do, whether that's booking or gating out a vehicle or gating in or whatever else it might be. Getting a little bit more into the operational yard side of things, again, we have the ability to visualize yards. So take a, a picture of a yard and configure it. Again, configuration is an end user activity. Configure it in the system 
uh, and basically you represent that yard then um, on the system. And, and, and you can see here when that updates, um, I can basically start to drill down into the different levels of the yard. Um, and as I go, get into more resolution, then more and more information becomes visible. And finally, I get to the point of viewing the individual vehicles themselves. So whether that's uh, uh, using the, the, the default icons within the system, as I've had here, or indeed actually assigning physical images of the vehicles themselves, again, you can do that through uh, configuration of the system. And then we get into the ability to set up the assets, the rail cars, to optimize rail cars, to, 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 to load plan optimize uh, uh, transporters, um, and basically to, to automate how we, we, we optimize um, based on parameters that we provide to the system. So whether, whether we want to plan vehicles within a particular dwell time, or a particular model, or a particular VIN pattern, uh, or a particular mode. And again, view the result of that optimization and the result of that, of, of that load plan. Uh, and ultimately the utilization of, of, of that particular asset. Uh, so again, we can go to many, many different levels of detail. We can process through different technologies. So obviously RF would be a, a common technology within a yard. But equally, we have the ability to support um, things like RFID, uh, where we can set up stations, transponders, activities, and determine through configuration um, what it means if a VIN enters or exits a particular zone. So we can configure the business logic that is triggered by a VIN exiting or entering a, an RFID zone. And again, that logic will immediately apply to the processes that we've, uh, that we've looked at. Again, we'll be creating documentation or indeed uploading documentation at any point in that process. Uh, but ultimately, we need the ability to, to view that in a, in a, in a user-friendly way. So Whatever the data in the system there, and there's a huge amount of underlying data there to, 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 to look at, we can visualize it um, through, through different tools. We have a, 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 our, our sort of dashboard that we use here. Um, but again, through any MIS tool that the organization, organization has, we can bring up um, various levels of, of, of visualization of, of, of the environment. And as with this one, we can typically click down through these things and. Um, go down to the raw data, extract it, email these things, schedule reporting of these items. So in summary, we've, we've been through a lot of screens very quickly there. Um, but what we've tried to show you there is, is, is how we might support or alleviate the problems we, we started out with. Um, we've talked a little bit about forecasting uh, and the ability to predict capacity at the various points in the supply chain based on the processes that we've created there. We talked about complexity. And again, the process execution engine really allows us to, to create processes of unlimited complexity, unlimited granularity. We can manage collaboration, effective collaboration, A, because this is a wholly browser-based solution, and B, because we have mechanisms such as to-do lists and, and a, a number of other things that promote, uh, A, the ability to, to, to coordinate and collaborate and have external parties uh, log into the system. But, but equally then to disseminate the consequence of individual failures to the other relevant parties within the system. We talked about things like push-pull. Again, a lot of these things here come back to, to trust, to confidence, um, and reliability on that ultimate promise date. And again, um, the process projection that, that, we, that we briefly showed you there uh, allows us to be very specific about the dates and times that we're going to actually uh, deliver that vehicle. And it takes into account all the localized diaries, localized holidays, uh, operating times of individual sites and points that that particular VIN is moving through. We have full control over the prediction and accrual of costs within that supply chain, as we, again, briefly showed you there. And through that overall process mechanism, and we come back to the process execution being the pivotal point of all this, we have the governance control. We have control tower. Uh, capabilities. Um, we have all the, 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 the start, finish time SLAs um, to allow us to report uh, and provide uh, KPIs across, again, the entire process. We have one view through that, that process there of, of, of plant to dealer uh, visibility, one version of the truth. 
And again, whether that's plant to dealer or whether it's a smaller part of the supply chain, that comes down to what you define within process capabilities. And ultimately, by providing a dynamic process, which is com uh, continually being reevaluated, this is not a static thing. Once that process is created, it's being continually reevaluated. Uh, any effect of updates to it are being reprojected. It might even decide to change the entire process if it feels that uh, it needs so to achieve the, the promised dates or the, or the parameters that we've given it. So through the technology that we're using, we, we basically are addressing um, many or most of these issues to, to some extent and providing ultimately this wholly integrated end-to-end -end solution. How much of it you, would, you need to use or want to use is entirely up to you, but it is an entire end-to-end -end capability um, for, for finished vehicles. Basically, our mission, just to uh, just to finish off, is, is really to support and promote this end-to-end -end, uh, capability through one integrated technology. Um, we are not a volume sales company. We're not out there selling lots and lots of packages. We're out there looking for strategic relationships. So hopefully, ones where we can offer immediate value and, and also you know a long-term uh, benefit and, 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 and partnership. We feel we have the, the knowledge and the experience to, to, to make it a two-way exchange of knowledge rather than just uh, uh, listening to the client and, and taking on board all that. We, we, we feel we can offer um, as much in, in terms of the relationship as, as, as we're getting back. Um, and from a technology point of view, we're trying to constantly improve um, the flexibility, the configurability of the system to, to, to the benefit of the customers. And to do that, we have to maintain a very healthy and extensive roadmap um, so that we continue to create differentiation and continue to, uh, to hopefully stay ahead of the market in terms of, uh, of what we need to support. And as I said at the beginning, our goal as ProAct is really to, uh, to try and, 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 br and bring this to, 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 to being a best of breed solution and recognize best of breed solution within the finished vehicle logistics market. So I've been, there, been through that very, uh, very rapidly today, just to give you a, uh, an overview of, uh, as I say, the problems that we come across, uh, the scope of the solution, and, and how the system itself might address that. Um, I'm going to stop there and, and hand back to Louis. So I'll thank you for listening today, and uh, we'll go into the, uh, the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Paul, for a very interesting webinar. Uh, great summary of some of the industry issues and challenges, uh, but more importantly, some ideas for, for solutions and solving some of, these, some of these issues. So thank you very much for that. And now we go to the Q&A section of the, of the webinar. So if you've, had any, if you've got any questions, uh, there is a, you, you should see on the side of your screen a place where you could ask, where you can type in the question. If you can't see the screen, there's a red arrow on the side of your screen where you can uh, click on the red, red arrow and that opens up the, uh, the screen where you can ask, uh, type in your questions. And of course, just a, a reminder that if you've got any technical issues, again, please type into the Q&A box and our team will do what they can to, to sort these out for you. So I've got a couple of questions in already. Um, the first question I'll ask is, um, an important connectivity point, I guess, uh, or collaboration point. What licensing models do you support? Um, we, we support a number of, of, of different models. Um, as I said, we, we're not a volume seller of, of, of packages. What we're, what we're basically doing is looking for relationships. And, and what that means is we have to uh, adapt to um, the, the particular issues and the challenges of the, of the individual clients we deal with. But typically, the different models might range from um, unlimited corporate level licenses where uh, the client can use it wherever uh, they wish in an unlimited fashion uh, and how much of the functionality they want to, um, right down to site licenses, to contract licenses, to user licenses, uh, hosted licenses, and, and, and even down to uh, uh, per VIN models. But essentially, uh, we'll ultimately work with the individual clients to determine what uh, what best follows their particular business model. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that answer. Uh, the next question comes from a vehicle logistics provider from North America. Does, are you able to do scenario modeling and optimization? Say, given a set of OD pairs and transportation options, 
uh, railheads or optional placement of uh, VDCs, etc. Can you pick and plan a new distribution system that optimizes price, speed, and flexibility, etc.? Um, probably the answer to that is, is no, not in, not in the way the question is asked. There, no, we're not a scenario modeling uh, system. We we are more of an execution system. So our strength is really when the network has been defined um, and basically using all the different uh, uh, network uh, availability in the most efficient way. So basically optimizing um, the usage of something that has been predefined, uh, whether that's uh, routings, whether it's service providers, uh, whether it's tariffs, um, and basically with the with the configuration of all the different um, decision logic that might be specific to models and manufacturers and things like that, we're taking all those things into account and trying to op some optimize the best supply chain. But we're not really about the uh, the initial setting up and determining uh, what that best supply chain is. We we are very much focused on on the, the subsequent planning and execution of that supply chain and, and the optimization of of of, uh, of assets in that such as rail cars, for example. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from the UK. How do you deal with specific customer requirements, and do you allow customers uh, do you allow customer specified enhancements? Um, yes, we do. This is um, although this is a, a, a sort of a package solution to all intents and purposes. I.e., we have one solution. Um, we 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 don't have any customer specific versions. Um, but however, most of our clients uh, will drive their own requirements into the system. So they might be going for new markets, um, new, new initiatives that they want to achieve in that market. So obviously from time to time, um, we will build in new requirements. But we build those requirements into the very core of the system. They become integrated with the, the core of the system, and they become part of that system um, from, from that point and, and forevermore. So uh, they're not lost in any future upgrades, they'll be there uh, from, from, from now on and, and, and evermore. Okay, uh, thank you for that. A question from Singapore. Who are the existing OEMs using this tool? Well, I mentioned um, a few of the OEMs there at the beginning, um, but there are some large, I mean, I won't, I won't talk specifically about them all, but there are some very large um, global OEMs using it in, in, in North America, um, Europe, uh, and elsewhere. So um, they are the major names that you would, you would expect. Uh, as I said, most of our relationships are with uh, third-party providers or LLPs, so they are using our system um, to manage uh, parts uh, of supply chains, particular supply chains for particular manufacturers. So it may be that we have more than one PROAC customer um, which is actually managing uh, Part, a different part of the supply chain for the same uh, um, global manufacturer. Um, but they are, I mean, the, the ones that I've, uh, I've mentioned at the beginning there the, on the slides, um, some are past uh, and, and some of those are, are, are current uh, uh, supply chains that we're managing. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, this is a bit of a cheeky question. So. Uh, uh, see how you can handle this one. What do you believe is your biggest benefit compared to your competition? Um, I think, well, a few things I, I would hope. Um, firstly, scope. Uh, so the, the, the scope and the depth of functionality that we offer in a single solution. Um, so obviously the ability to, to do the, the, the plant to deal a bit, but also um, the ability to do complex yard management, again, within uh, one integrated solution, if you like, a, a one-stop shop for, for finished vehicle logistics. Um, probably the key thing in terms of technology is the process execution engine, um, which, again, as I said, is, is, is sort of fundamental to the technology. Um, it's actually a technology that we've that sort of developed over many years, and we originally started it as a as an R&D uh, project with UPS uh, in Atlanta many years ago, uh, and it's evolved into what it is today. But essentially, the, the, the principle there is that we don't enforce particular processes um, uh, on anybody. What we do is we say, what are those processes? What are the processes that you have that you need to achieve? And those processes may differ um, for, for different clients. If it's a 3PL or an LLP managing many different clients, 
Um, the processes will be different for every client. They may be different for every type of vehicle or model within those clients. Those clients might be sharing resources. They might be going through common mixing centers, for example. Um, and what we, uh, what the process execution engine allows us to do is to model every individual process. Uh, again, whether it's down to the manufacturer or the model or the VIN or whatever it is, we can we can model all those processes and have the system automatically and dynamically apply the correct process uh, uh, for that particular VIN as it, as it comes through the system. That technology deals with the projection, it deals with the timings, it deals with scheduling, it deals with capacity, um, it deals with all the other factors um, within the supply chain. So um, in terms of agility, flexibility, uh, and the ability to change, I think that the process execution engine probably is, is, uh, is, is the biggest differentiator that we have. Okay, thank you for that answer. Uh, a question from Asia. As you know, the Indian stroke China market is mainly driven by cost. How effective do you feel your service would be for the OEMs in these countries? Um, again, the, the, the system be through, through various types of modeling, uh, or uh, uh, license modeling and cost modeling, we can um, hopefully make it uh, viable to, to any particular scenario. Um, it's a hosted solution, so uh, it was. It, sorry, it's it's a browser-based solution, so it can be hosted anywhere. So um, it could be hosted in country, out of country. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of options in terms of um, uh, in terms of the the, 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 the physical deployments. Um, but as I said, the cost model can follow anything that uh, the, cl the client cares to, to throw at us. Really, we you know we have different ways of approaching it. Whether we're doing it as a, as, a, as a corporate license or whether we're funding a corporate license over a period of time, whether that's months or, or years, or whether we're paying for it on a, on a per VIN basis. Um, basically, there are many ways to make this cost effective for, for virtually any market. Um, so I, I would say to, to, to anybody who has that particular concern or is interested in the solution is, is, is talk to us because uh, I'm, I'm fairly confident we could uh, we could we could uh, propose something that is viable for for for, that, for their particular scenario. Okay, thanks for that. Um, a question from the UK again: Is there a limit to the number of clients you can manage in one instance of the software? Um, there is no the theoretical limit. No, it, it is meant to be multi-client. Um, so really, it ultimately comes down to volumes and hardware. But there is no restriction. On how many clients, or how many sites, or how many processes, or uh, or, or anything else, really, it usually comes down to uh, uh, to the amount of, uh, of of hardware that's needed to uh, to run one client as a pair, as opposed to running ten clients. It's, it's really a scalability issue then. But no, there is no limit on uh, on on any of the entities within the system. Okay, thanks, Paul. I think we're we're getting to the to the end of the webinar. So, is there any final comments that you want to make? Um, really, just to re-emphasise that um, you know we have a, a very much a, a, a focus on finished vehicle logistics. Um, we believe we have uh, a very capable solution at this point in time, but uh, equally, um, the investments that we're making and, and the the activities that, that we're having within the Finch vehicle logistics arena will only increase. Um, it is a focus for us, and, and it is very much our intention to try and bring this to to, to, to be a best of breed solution, a recognised best of breed off the shelf solution for this marketplace. So, um, every new customer that we get, really, we, we we're looking at ways to enhance what we do, uh, enhance their experience. So. Uh, we're more than happy to work with every individual customer on a case-for-case -case basis, look at their particular challenges, whether they're uh, operational, cost, uh, whatever they might be, uh, and work with, uh, work with them to come up with a, with a viable solution that's going to um, firstly, hopefully, differentiate them from, from, from the rest of the market and, and, and B, um, give them a, a cost-effective and viable solution. So we're, we're happy to talk to, uh, to anybody about their particular challenges. Okay, now the, I will throw one more question out because we've had a, you know, a bit of interest from, uh, from Asia and China. So just a, kind of maybe a final question. Does this system support double byte uh, Chinese language? 
Indeed it does. It is, it is two bytes compatible, so we have deployed it. So we have deployed systems in, uh, with simplified Chinese screens in, in the past, um, uh, and, and we're just in the process of deploying screens with, uh, uh, with, with other two byte uh, uh, languages as well. So yes, it is fully two byte compliant. Uh, the dictionaries, as, uh, just as an aside, the dictionaries reside within the system. So, um, again, through configuration, the end user can add their own dictionaries, add their own terminologies, or indeed change all the dictionaries and the wording and, and, and the phrases and the characters in the system themselves. So, uh, there is a lot of flexibility over language. Okay, thank you very much for that, Paul. Uh, and thank you very much for, to everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Paul, for a very informative seminar. Uh, the webinar will be uploaded into our archives and accessible in future for all of your colleagues who have been unable to attend the live presentation. You can access this and any previous webinar via the Automotive Logistics website. And if you've got any further questions, you can contact uh, PROACT directly or email us uh, or me here at Automotive Logistics for more information. Uh, but thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We hope you'll join us again for our next webinar. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you from Proact. Thank you.